G'day Legends, I hope you've all had a fantastic week. It is time for another installment of Friday Q&A. As always, if you submitted a question last week, thank you so much, I'm gonna do my best to get to it. And if you would like to ask me absolutely anything, simply put it in the comments section below. If you check the video description, you can support my channel in a variety of different ways, whether it's buying some of the music that I make with Ragdoll, signing up to my Patreon, joining the Discord server. There's a whole bunch of ways you can do that. You can even snag yourself some free presets and IRs. Just follow the links in there. All right, time to answer some questions. We should start this week by talking about the new Metallica song or the new Dalica song, as people down here might say. I really like it. Lux Eterna, if you've checked YouTube at all over the last week, you've probably had either the song or some YouTuber breaking down the song or reacting to the song. So I'm going to assume that all the good people who watch my channel have heard that song. I liked it for a couple of different reasons. One, super short and punchy and very to the point. It's got some of that punk energy that early thrash was really renowned for. There's one of the most Kirk sounding Kirk solos of all time on it. And I'm sure there's going to be people doing videos like, what would Lux Eterna sound like if Kirk used a Y in the solo? Feel free to steal that idea from me because I don't think I'm going to get around to doing that one. You can check out my five minute licks video where we took a look at that thing that Kirk does. James and Lars sound great on it. Rob sounds great on it. I really like the overall production. I think it, you know, if anything, could be a little bit more wet, like put some pitch detune on that solo or put a slightly bigger reverb throw on the final vocal. But then again, what do I know? Metallica have done this many, many millions of times more than I ever have. So I would be pretty keen to hear everybody's thoughts in the comments. Were you surprised? Was it a pleasant surprise? And have you been jamming the new song and figured out the main riff in there? It kind of reminds you of like a cross between Kill 'Em All, uh, a Diamond Head song, and then like Merciful Fate, Curse of the Pharaohs or something like that. So kind of sounds like they really got their mojo back for that. And the album is going to be very interesting. We'll keep talking about metal. Have I ever tried or even heard of the Damasio Very Metal pedal? Not until this point, but there's a little treat coming up. I read this question earlier in the week and kind of thought Damasio Very Metal, never even heard of it. And then I was looking through this, this uh, guitar buyer's guide from 1991. And I'm going to do a kind of thorough read through of this on the channel on Sunday if you tune in. So if you've got like nothing better to do for about 50 minutes, I'm going to be going through all the guitars, amps and effects in there and just adding my irreverent commentary. But I did see that listed in there. So look out for that one. Uh, if you've got one, let me know more about it. I'm kind of curious to know that Damasio made a pedal at one point. I'm going to paraphrase this question very slightly. Uh, somebody in the comments was talking about how they had just picked up a Strymon Mobius and how they're on their way to getting what I would call the Strifecta or the Strymon Bridge, the timeline, the Mobius and the Big Sky. And their question is, people like me, I'm kind of nostalgic about old rack gear from the late 80s, early 90s. It's kind of made a little bit of a comeback recently. In 30 years, do I think that guitar players will be nostalgic for timelines and you know, Big Skies and you know, Mobiuses, Mobii. I don't know. It's a good question, nevertheless. Interestingly, when you think about the early 90s, the early 60s was as far away from the early 90s as the early 90s is from now. And what was happening in the early 90s kind of had this like retro rock thing happening. You know, there was still a lot of hair metal happening, but bands were moving away from that and stripping stuff down. I think of a band like cry of love who are kind of vibing on like cream and free and those sort of ideas and then think of like the mid 2000s where you had bands like jet and wolf mother kind of doing the late 60s 70s thing again so i think with a lot of these things it's probably more like what happens with keyboard music than guitar music with digital pedals you know the 90s and then i want to say maybe like 15 20 years ago you had a lot of really dry sounding production where people moved away from using time-based effects more to kind of roomy sounds or in-your-face sounds. And that had happened in the early 80s, and I'm sure it had happened earlier with that. You know, tastes kind of inevitably change and cycle around. You know, if you haven't heard a huge reverb for a little while and then you hear a huge reverb, you might get inspired to put that on a particular recording. I think the Strymon stuff is definitely classic and will be remembered as some of the best pedals ever made. I put like the Eventide 
H9 and their factor series in there and a few other things, but it'll be, I mean, we'll have to check in in 30 years. Who knows what type of medium, who knows what type of medium we'll be using to communicate because I'm sure in the early 90s, guitar players hauling racks around wouldn't imagine that, you know, in 30 years we'd be on this thing called the internet lusting after stuff like Eventides and 2290s. Very, very long way around to say, I can't predict the future, but I'm sure at some point people will be nostalgic for the early Strymon pedals and the stuff that we kind of take for granted now. And there's probably some stuff which we don't really rate now that, you know, in 30 years, whatever the Leon Todd of YouTube will be at the time will be saying, hey, this stuff sounded really good. People didn't get it at the time because they're morons. And I mean, hey, <laughs> they'd be right about me being a moron. My thoughts on Steelheart. I really, really like Steelheart. Amazing, amazing vocals. Uh, this question stems from me talking about the movie Rockstar last week. So if you haven't checked out Steelheart, the ballad She's Gone is one of the great hairband ballads, if not the greatest, uh, maybe not the greatest, probably like top five, just incredible vocal performance on there. And I also like some of their harder rock stuff like Sticky Side Up. Sounds like Motley Crue if they all had amazing, ridiculous chops on there. So yeah, if you haven't listened to some Steelheart, in the words of Molly Meldrum, do yourself a favor. Doing the wet dry wet thing with a single fractal is definitely possible. Basically wet dry wet has more to do about your speaker setup than your actual rig. I think the fractal makes it very easy to route wet dry wet. What I would do would be to like split up the grid so that I would have my dry output going to a center cabinet. I know some people who like to use a traditional power amp and guitar cabinet for that. So you wouldn't need an IR on there. And then either two more cabinets for your wet effects or two FR, FR speakers. That seems to be something that, at least to me, I've seen you know at least three people with that kind of rig where you have a four by 12 in the middle, then two FR, FRs on the side. The FR, FRs have IRs on them and all your time-based effects. And maybe you use an expression pedal to kind of bring those in and out. That's probably how I would do that. That feels like a best of both worlds where you get the thump out of the cabinet, but you also get the lovely lush stereo spread. And whether you put a little bit of those wet effects into that dry cabinet, it's kind of up to you. That's part of the fun. There is no right or wrong way to do wet, dry, wet, in my opinion. It's actually way easier with something that's all digital because you don't need a line mixer to you know, make sure that there's no phase issues or you're not killing your dry signal or anything like that. So if you've got the gear, try it out. What is my background, like my ethnic genetic background, whatever you want to call it? I definitely identify as an Aussie, you know, I was born here, I grew up here, you know, love going to the beach, love smashing meat pies and drinking chalky milks. I played footy and cricket as a kid. Uh, I enjoy the musical stylings of Farnsey, Barnsey and Sobranzi. So yeah, definitely somebody who I think self-identifies as an Aussie, but my mum is like third or fourth generation Irish. There was a lot of Irish emigration to Australia with the gold rushes in the 1890s. And I think someone in the family's kind of traced it back to around there. And then my dad, moved to Australia when he was 12 from what was then Yugoslavia. So some Balkan DNA in there, hence the last name Todorovic. So that one, everybody here found difficult to pronounce. So that's kind of why I ended up going with, you know, the stage name of Leon Todd. And when I started a YouTube channel, that's why it was Leon Todd. Leon Todd definitely sounds kind of more like an Irish name, doesn't it? But uh, the last name is yeah Todorovic. So uh, Shout out to probably all my cousins and relatives there in the Balkans and in Ireland and all across Australia. And, you know, it sounds corny, but we're all human beings at the end of the day, especially if you're into music. If you're into music, you immediately have so much in common with people. So, yeah, it's that sort of like ethnic or racial identity is way less of a thing here than, say, in the United States. I feel like Australia, it's a little bit more like the UK where... It's more about class than it is about race or ethnicity. But, you know, that's a pretty sweeping generalization and I wouldn't really hang my hat on that. But yeah, anyway, that's that's me. Like a lot of people out there, just a bit of a mutt who loves distortion. Do I think that mainstream cinema is maybe in decline with stuff from the late 80s, early 90s better than it is today? It's an interesting question. As always, it's way easier to look back at things that we know were successful and say, well, these successful things were great. And the things that we have now, eh, they're not doing it for me. 
But I think with modern cinema, it's got to compete against streaming services and syndicated TV shows. I feel like the modern Netflix, you know, 10 episode a season thing has kind of supplanted traditional cinema. There is something beautiful about a 90 to 150 minute movie and creating this little universe and telling a story that way. And there's still people doing amazing stuff that way. I mean, we've even got stuff now where, you know, animated mediums and computer generated imagery is able to tell some of that story as well. Uh, one of my favorite things, and it's you know obviously not a movie, it's a series of shorts on Netflix called Love, Death and Robots. And if you haven't seen Jibaro, I believe it's called, it's absolutely stunning, like incredible visual storytelling. It kind of makes you think like, what's everybody else doing? Why aren't they doing this? So I really, really enjoyed that. That's probably the one visual media that I've seen recently that has absolutely blown my mind. I think as well, you know, with there being fewer, larger, uh, like conglomerates, like, you know, your Disney's and all those kind of things, uh, they're obviously going to take fewer risks. So if they know people want to go and see a Marvel movie, they're going to stick to that formula. And it's a license to print money at the end of the day. So whether you consider that cinema or not, I think uh, is a totally different proposition. But, you know, I've watched some really, really amazing TV series recently where, uh, basically, it's like 10 movies. You know, they go out and they, they do a whole season and there's so much involved in it. So, yeah, I don't know. Is it in decline or is it just different? It's There's definitely some different stories being told. That's what I like. Less the, hey, we're going to do a 90s animated Disney movie and do it with an ensemble cast because you're still going to like the animated movie better and more the like, well, what are some different stories that we can tell? Even with the animated Disney stuff. Like, I loved Moana. I loved Encanto. That was fantastic. Like just telling different stories from different parts of the world is super fun. It's kind of like music, you know, like there's so much stuff out there. There's so many human experiences that can be communicated. Uh, I feel like that's a similar thing. You know, you might say, oh, well, modern pop music sucks. I don't like it. Music's in decline. But have you gone and listened to pop music from Korea or Japan or India or the Middle East or Africa or South America, you know, there's there's a lot of humans on this earth making a lot of great art. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's Q&A. Again, if you have questions for next week's video, put them in the comment section below. I'll do my best to get to as many of them as I can. And I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. Take it easy and I'll see you next time.